Welcome to the Fen and Chat Hour. And today we're going to be doing something a bit different. Uh, we have a slightly revamped, rebooted version of the Fen and Chat Hour. Uh, if you saw the, the last or listened to the last episode, you'll you'll hear us talking about uh, Fen and Chat Hour as it was um, over the last 18 months and how we sort of tied everything up and, and brought it to an end, certainly in that format. But the one thing that sort of came about from the show, sort of the most popular elements of it, was the, the interviews. And I think that's, after having a think, um, I've decided that maybe that's uh, the way forward and just do like a, uh, a routine, regular show uh, where we interview people who are significant in the, the community and area um, who have something to say. So we're still keeping it Fenland and the idea is to talk to uh, people who are prominent or significant or have done something or just interesting characters who who have come from the Fenland or involved in the Fenland or some way, some connection some way and just a chance to talk to them and, and just find out about themselves and what the place means to them. So today we have uh, Rick Savage, who is a local artist and who's also done some broadcasting in his time. He's a publisher. He's, uh, he's He was an, a landlord long before Al Murray. He was... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's, you know, he's, he, he is an interesting character and I'm sure we'll learn all about him today. Uh, would you like to say hello? Hello, hello. And it's I, I I would like to say how lovely it is to be face to face uh, here in your studio. Yes, we we did a podcast about six months ago, uh, the art of COVID, which is on here. You'll find it uh, in the previous previous episodes, and we did an interview with um, yourself and Jen, Kate, uh, Caitlin. Caitlin Ferguson, and. Uh, which was, yeah, it was a fantastic run of, well, I think it was four four episodes, four different sets of artists or four pairs of artists. And, yeah, they've all done uh, done really well and they've uh, been very popular and got a good response from them. That was a really interesting thing to be part of. Yeah, and it's it's nice to know or to see that some of the, the artists have actually uh, come back and said that they want to be involved in further, further recordings. Uh, well, who wouldn't want to be? Or people just like to talk. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I think you've found my level. <laughs> well, that's good. Talking is, is that's all, it's what it's all about. You know, that's what we want, um, people who, who want to talk and to, to talk about Absolutely. what they've done. Now, you've, you've had a few changes in your life and certainly it's, it's uh, no longer sort of, it's not, not the end of your your run, but certainly you've had to hit certain phases and, and you've decided to make changes um, in, in your life. So that's that's basically what we're, we're going to sort of talk about, how, you know, these significant milestones have have, okay. <laughs> have, uh, have happened. But you've also had such a fascinating life up to this point. So that's kind of what we want to do is sort of go back through your, your history. and okay. sort of, Oh, that's, that's a worrying <laughs> thought. If, if, if that's okay, <laughs> you know. Uh, what time does this go in? <laughs> no, I'll keep it clean. Don't worry, I'll keep it clean. Yeah, well, I and mean, we can always put an E rating on if necessary. <laughs> Restricted for uh, an R rating for. Oh if my it, uh... goodness! No, I'm sure it'll be fine. So, Rick Savage, tell us a little bit about yourself. A quick sort of bio. Oh. Well, where do, I mean, it's where to start, right? I, I, I suppose fundamentally, I'm an artist. Mm -hmm. um, that is how I see myself, and uh, that has been the mainstay of my life. I was start. Uh, my mother said I was starting to draw before I could write my own name. Um, uh, art has been like the lettering through a stick of Blackpool rock for me. It's just gone all the way from start. Uh, not quite till finish. Well, not yet anyway. Um, but I started off at school. Uh, and I always wanted to be an artist, always wanted to get into uh, um, illustration, uh, kids' stories, uh, and that's, that's sort of how things started. I've always had a, a, a fascination with uh, comic book art, uh, which sort of it was comics when I started, mm. 
Uh, the grown-ups call them graphic novels. Yeah. Um, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, but, I, I mean, I, 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 love, I love that genre. Um, so that's how I started. Um, and the art has sort of kind of gone with me through the various sort of stages of my, uh, uh, of my career. Is it too pretentious to say career? Yeah, why not? Uh, <laughs> a, a career lasts a lifetime, so... Well, uh, so it, it went from there. I did I did a proper job, I think, for about a fortnight. Um, I turned professional disc jockey, uh, DJ, when mm-hmm. I was... I, I say disc jockey, DJ. Uh, I said that once in the bar. Somebody asked me uh, what I was doing sort of as a youngster, and I said, I was a disc jockey. I said, well, what's one of those then? <laughs> uh, I suppose it's showing my age. But I was a, a pro DJ for about seven years, mm. which was one of my first jobs after leaving school. So I, I started when I was about 18 and, and just sort of carried on with that. And then uh, then bought a pub. There was a few things I did when I was a DJ. I had an opportunity to go on pirate radio, Hospital radio and that sort of thing, and I really, I, I really wanted to get onto radio. Um, I auditioned a couple of times for the BBC, uh, but they decided that they could get on perfectly well without me, <laughs> and I bet they're kicking themselves for that now. Yeah, I'm sure they are. <laughs> but you talk about pirate radio. I mean, everyone's got the idea of either it's a pirate ship or it, it's yeah. um, Radio Caroline, where it's stuck out in the North Sea. And it would have been lovely. I, I would have, I would have quite liked that. Was that uh, not the kind was, of pirate race? No, thing? <laughs> it was land-based pirates back in the 1980s. Was that the ones where you sort of move around from flat to flat and you're yeah, broadcasting was, uh, and then oh, trying to make we, sure that you don't get caught? We've been broad- <laughs> We used to broadcast in all sorts of sheds. <laughs> <laughs> we, we actually nearly got uh, got uh, prosecuted for having an illegal CB radio, which was outside the uh, pirate radio station. We had uh, uh, two cars at the end of the street with CB radios uh, in case we saw the, the van with the big aerials so we could shut down quickly. Uh, then we decided that there was a much better way of doing it, which was... Uh, I hope I'm not giving the game away for any... It, I don't suppose there is such a thing as pirate radio anymore, is there? I, it's, I'm it's, really it's, it's not It's fascinating sure. how, it, how it has changed. I mean, there are a lot of... I think now you've got so many radio stations, it's how do you police everyone? Yeah. And I think it's more the music content it's pbs and the yeah. the, the agencies that that want the the cut and the the royalties of of music i think music and and presenting and broadcasting has changed quite significantly yeah. in the last sort of 10 15 years yeah uh, and uh, of course my my time is going back over 30 years so um it, it was very very different then i mean the people still remembered the marine offences act mm. which basically shut down the the nautical pirates, yeah, um, but it, it 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 was good fun. It was good fun in those days. I mean, it it's launched nice. a lot of careers. I mean, yeah, it was sort of for sure. A lot of people um, started started off on Radio Caroline yeah. and, and went off on Radio Luxembourg and and went off to to great things. Yeah, and some didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just just thinking back, there's there's the the chap that was on the news a couple of years ago who was broadcasting from his own studio in his garden shed. Yeah. He, he, he's been yeah. broadcasting for about 30-odd years and he, he had an audience of one. Yeah. Because his wife would would listen to the show on her radio in the kitchen yeah. until she decided to go shopping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then it went back down to zero. Yeah. But I, but I, I think there's a passion for, for getting the word out there. I think, you know, the, there is something about the ability to communicate mm. that uh, a lot of us just sort of tap into because it, it's to get your message out there in whatever way is kind of important to a lot of us. Yeah. I think also you've all, you've had a shift now. So you've got those who had to fight tooth and nail to get into a position where they were able to be a presenter, a DJ, um, on television or, or one some, some form of media mm. to suddenly the shift where everyone can be it. So it's, it's gone from one to yeah. to everybody and everyone can be a presenter, everyone can be a video um, 
presenter or star, mm. a radio presenter. Uh, so now, in the case of who do you listen to? Yeah. You know, it's trying to find that voice out of the millions of people who have got something to say. Yeah. You know, everyone has, everyone wants to talk about things that it's personal to them. But how do you find them? Yeah. And it, but it's it's uh, all very well people wanting a subject that's personal to them. It's who wants to listen to you. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I know from this, you know, there's, we we have a a strange set of audience. Not they're strange. It's just just oh. the the demographics of where they're well, the geographics of where they're they're located. Yeah. Yeah. We we love the audience. You know? Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. This, but where they are situated is not what you would expect. I mean. Predominantly, the Fenland, we would have, when we set it up, we thought that it would be, the majority would be people from the Fenland because it's, you know, well, that, it, it, in the title. Yeah. However, that doesn't seem to be the case. The The majority seem to be um, in America. Well, it's like two thirds of our audience oh, is wow. in America and all over America as well. It's not just one particular place, it's. What 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 draws them? To, have you had a chance to find out what is drawing them to, uh, you know, a Fenland radio? Possibly expats. I mean, I've mentioned it. We've we've never had any feedback. It would be lovely to hear from someone um, as to why. Um, but the, the thoughts so are it's probably um, expats or people who are Brits who have who are from here and have gone over to there, live over there, or they just want to know what's going on in the UK. I'm sure there's there's a message thing on the uh, at the bottom of the uh, link, isn't there? Yes, there is. Well, there's always, I, there's always I, I a, think we well, I think there's we always really, means of, of getting in touch. Yeah, I, mean, I really do think that they there ought to if you're listening to this, it would be really great to know how far away you are and why you want to listen. Mm. I, I I would be personally fascinated to know. Uh, that's, I mean, it's the the demographics, the sort of the analytics. They tell you, you know, where people are, but it doesn't tell you why. why? You know, what, yeah. what's the significance? And no, I mean, don't, don't don't get me wrong. I'm delighted that they are listening. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 the fact that I can talk to someone in Colombia or someone in Ukraine yeah. or someone in. We've had someone from Iran. We've had um, Philippines, Malaysia. You know, it's 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 truly a global show sure. not a massively global show but we have such a, a wide reading, ranging audience and it's it it's, it does it's make you very humble very small when you when you suddenly realize how big or bigger area that you you that people will listen to but it it's great with with having that because i mean if you only really wanted it to be a handful of people just round the corner you'd be doing this with a baked bean tin and a bit of string yeah you know it's it's nice that it's you getting out there you talk about you know ironically we sort of do the the switch between um going from global to probably a very small audience uh, you talk about uh, being in hospital radio how hmm? how was that then I th that was that was really good fun actually. Um, it it was it was an unusual setup um, because it was a psychiatric hospital, uh, and for a hospital radio station, normally you've got a dozen really really keen disc jockeys that want to fill sort of thirty minute shows because everybody's wanting to get and their broadcast time. Mm. is something like an hour a day or maybe two hours a day. We'd got nine till five to fill <laughs> six, well, seven <laughs> days a week. And so we had uh, people recording shows. We, I mean, that was a huge schedule. Mm. Uh, I was uh, program controller for a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, was, it was desperate to find enough people to fill the shows. And it meant that sort of the, the ones that were keen um, that got to do more shows than they were perhaps expecting to 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 do. I mean, for myself, I had to cover things like uh, the religious slot. Uh, I had to do a classical radio show. I mean, I've always been fond of classical music, but to do a a two hour show once a week for for classical music was a little bit of a stretch for me. Yeah. Um, Does that make your head hurt when you're you're trying to sort of 
talk about things that maybe maybe not your specific passion, but trying to think what to say. Or? I, I but I, radio w- was my passion at, at, at that time, and I, I think also I would be uh, probably in my early twenties when that was happening. And you've got an energy when you're in <laughs> your early twenties that you wish you'd have you wish you'd have saved a little bit for later life. <laughs> We we talk about um, radio playlists in thing, places like funerals um, mm. and services where the, there's like a list of things that you shouldn't play. Yeah, uh, is there something for um, psychiatric a, a psychiatric hospitals? Or, yeah, is there but, a lot but, of songs that are sort of on the the no list? Yeah, we 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 did. Uh, I mean, it, it was basically records that you would expect to find on Radio 2. No disrespect to Radio 2, I'm a very great listener, uh, and I'd like to say hello to Ken Bruce. Um, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> um, but it was a, roughly a Radio 2-type playlist, but there were certain songs that were real no-nos. Uh, for example, The Lunatics Have Taken Over the <laughs> Asylum was frowned upon, uh, stuff like pink insane Floyd. in the main brain, or <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean anything that 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 sort of highlighted that. I mean, Pink Floyd from mm. the Dark Side of the Moon album. Um, uh, the opening lyrics: "The lunatic is on the grass." Yeah, <laughs> they raise the blade, they make the change, they rearrange me till I'm safe. No, that's not going to get hit on the playlist for that. Yeah, but by and large, we let the we let the music sort of uh, uh, be guided by the the individual DJs that were, were were broadcasting, and they were great. I have to say, I'm still in contact with with a few of them. Um, Neil Whiteside is uh, on uh, one of the Cambridge radio stations okay. these days, and uh, Gary Lee, another good mate of mine, has he does a podcast with uh, a, a really brilliant character called the Scary Guy. Ooh. If you <laughs> want to, want to check, check him out, he's a very heavily tattooed man, mm-hmm. uh, but he's very much for um, positive uh, uh, positive body image. Mm. The fact he is very tattooed and he does look very scary. Yeah. This is the Scary Guy, not <laughs> Gary Lee. <laughs> Gary Lee doesn't look at all scary. Um uh, but the scary guy does look very scary, but he's really very, very mild mannered. Yeah, and it's not judging a book by its cover. Yeah, really. yeah. I mean, I, I'm guessing that the hospital radio was all voluntary as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. So how how would you find it difficult to get a constant stream of uh, DJs to come through and volunteer? So, it must have been- so totally not. I mean, it's anybody who's got. I mean, anybody that's got three singles and a, a record player, a dance set record player, thinks that they've got a chance on radio, uh, and they queue up. They really? form an orderly queue to join your radio station. You've only got to put a, a small article in the paper. We're looking for uh, DJs, and they fall out of the woodwork. Or it, it certainly was sort of back in. I the know 80s. it's changed slightly now. There's there's less people willing to 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 do so that 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 is a great shame if if that's the case but it was a a great stepping board to go from hospital radio into places like uh radio cambridgeshire uh, radio uh, bedfordshire as it was i was down in hertfordshire so it it, those were the stations picking us up at that time and it's a way of getting used to the idea of talking uh quite often You'd be in a little room all mm. on your own, talking to yourself or talking to your listener. Yes. Um, uh, and it, it got you used to the idea of being able to do that. And um, the, the the one thing that they didn't tell you back back in the day is that they didn't really want disc jockeys. They didn't want people who could play records. Mm. They wanted people, they were basically radio journalists. Yeah. They wanted people who could talk, who could put a show together like that. Unfortunately, when I was auditioning for the, the BBC, nobody had mentioned that at all to me. And I was so woefully unprepared yeah. that uh, I, I really didn't stand a chance. And they quite rightly rejected 
me. Uh, that wasn't that wasn't where I was. A few mm. le- a few years later on, I think I would have had a much better stab at it. Yeah, because I'd actually seen a bit of life and uh, was perhaps a little bit more interesting as a broadcaster. Yeah, not not just a, a specific sk- skill set. They're, they're asking for sort of a wider range. Yeah. And and life being one of them, mm. that you, if you're going to talk to other people on other subjects, you needed to have been uh, seen a bit of life. I mean, one of the interviews I did on hospital radio, uh, when I was doing the uh, religious show, I interviewed the, the Bishop of Bedford. Uh, and at, at 20 years old, quite what you were going to say to the Bishop of Bedford um, it was probably as big a mystery to him when I actually said it. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't, <laughs> wasn't quite as bad as why are you wearing that tall hat, sir? <laughs> it wasn't quite as bad as that. But I asked, I mean, you, you do a little bit of research, but mm. I, I would probably have a better stab at asking questions now than I did then. I think, is it a case of... Knowing enough about subject, but also having filters that stop you asking the questions that maybe everybody you want else to wants knows. to ask. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, you you have got to have a degree of common sense, mm-hmm. which comes with. Uh, I'm probably not demonstrating that right now, but <laughs> but uh, I, I think as you get older, well, they say older and wiser. Mm. One out of two is not bad, is it? Well, yeah. No, I'm sure it'd be fine. I'm sure you tick both boxes now. Well, yeah, so, I mean, from from radio, I, I think really basically um, once I, I discovered that I really hadn't got the tools to do the job uh, for radio, um, I went on to, to look for something different. Yeah, you mentioned about uh, doing a stint in te- television. Oh yeah, I mean this this was a, a very small was, stint. It was a very small stint. It, it, it was uh, a, a small bit. I, I ended up doing all sorts of weird and wonderful things because it was difficult to get people to fill the jobs. Uh, but it was hosp- the same hospital. Um, it was uh, an hours sort of magazine type program with uh, a, a few elements. There was a couple of presenters. Uh, we used to sort of go around the hospital sort of interviewing staff mostly. We had to be very careful who we interviewed and on what subjects we interviewed them on. Sometimes we had patients sort of lined up for us, uh, uh, but all of that was very uh, heavily monitored, mm. and rightly so. I yeah. mean, you know, it's, uh, there's people's privacy and all the rest of it, and you, you've got to have interview the right people. But it was, it, that, I mean, that was an interesting thing to do. It, it gives, it opens your eyes to a, 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 something very different from radio once you start sort of doing visual aspects to things. Yeah. And I did a bit of presenting, but I did some of the technical aspects of it too. Um, I, I found that fascinating. I, I've always loved f- seeing films being made. Uh, the editing process. I've I've had the privilege of watching Dave here uh, editing bits and pieces, and I am in awe of uh, the amount of time, the amount of effort, the amount of thought that goes into the editing of uh, for for video. I mean, uh, he, he uh, Dave. I, 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 I wish you could see. I'm, it. I'm blushing. He is blushing. <laughs> I wish. I wish there was a, a a video side to this right now. He is a very very bright pink, but it is true. <laughs> I mean, I'm not. I'm not just saying that because you're here. You are. You, this Dave's a very very skilled uh, a videographer. Mm. Would that be? Yeah. Very I, skilled. I, I, I. It's weird. I don't see myself as an artist. Oh, well, but yeah, it's I mean, a, it's a skill set, and it's. Yeah. And but it's it. But it is there is an art. art there is a for art form in it. Yeah, um, it's 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 taken a long time to actually consider myself a, a, an artist, because I just felt that I, all I was doing was just mirroring other people's lives. But I, it, it becomes more of an art form as you start become you yeah. you, you become, or you take a more artistic route within within the media. I mean. When you when you're doing live events, you are kind of just sort of following what's happening, and there's there's, there's no real. 
it's probably going to tread on people's toes here and say the artist uh, the artistry is the sort of the fluid fluidness of how you put it together mm. so it looks and sounds right which is a skill in itself and it is. it's but what my sort of um talking about is the more sort of the the art films the sort of introspective looks at people's mm. lives document uh, documentaries and things which does take on like a an artistic uh, element in its its own right but every genre of te- television and media and mm. stuff is all has a, an aspect within the field of art it's also kind of like uh, the difference between photographers mm. now it doesn't take an awful, especially in these days of digital technology, and I'm, I'm uh, not wanting to in any way, shape or form um, minimalise the the, uh, the skill set involved with uh, photographers, but these days it's not too difficult to get uh, something in shot mm. and in focus. Mm. It's That's not too difficult. But where... The artist artistry in uh, photography starts to take off is how you see things, mm. and and look at the angles, look at the lighting, look at the. It, there's, there's that a that lot hasn't of elements, changed. And, but it, there is an artistry to it. Yeah. Or, although photography, I don't think it's been easier to get into than it is now. I mean, anybody who's got a telephone, uh, telephone. Sounds so old. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody that's got a phone has probably got a better camera on their phone than most most people. I won't say professional photographers, but um, but the the phone on your camera is is uh, sorry the phone on your camera. That's probably about right. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, it is it is a very sensitive piece of kit, mm. and you can take some stunning pictures with your phone these yeah. days. But it's to make it art. Um, it's it's looking at the light. It's getting the right thing in the right place at the right time. It's the the preparation yeah, for yeah. it. I mean, I I used to be a photographer, and I one thing I noticed was that obviously with the the change to digital, you know, suddenly it went from the the minorities to to everyone having it. Yeah. So everyone then considered themselves to be a, a photographer. photographer. Yeah. And they were like, well, we used to get jobs cancelled because it was a case of, oh, well... My such mate and such will as, do it for a fiver. Well, not even that. It's just like we've we've managed to acquire a, a digital camera and we'll do it ourselves. Yeah. You know, and it's it's that sudden eating away, eroding of the the skill set. Yeah. Um, and, and it wasn't the decision. I mean, I, I realised that photography as a career was kind of dead anyway for for me so i looked at, at video video was sort of the next um what was i think well, always had been a passion i think that's where i always wanted to be uh filmmaking um from from childhood i just didn't realize it in mm-hmm. case of I, I was moving that direction but didn't realize why but i'm i'm kind of finding that now again where the the technology is catching up, so everyone can make films with the smartphone. You know the yeah. you know the the new um, is Apple phone. It's now so cinematic. I mean, there are still limitations. You still you know still won't do certain types of shots. But the majority, you know, if you want to go and make a, a film, I mean, there there are what three or four major films now that have been made on. An iPhone that are out in the cinema. That's quite incredible. You know, but at the end of the day, it's you can stand there with a camera, but unless you actually know what you're going to film, yeah, that that's the the difference. Yeah, you know, sure. you can take yeah. a shot and you can film an event, but are you telling the story? Yeah, and how are you put it together? And it's that planning, it's the story, it's the vision, it's seeing how it's all going to put uh, you know, come together. Yeah, you know, that's those months of planning. You know, that's a big difference to just standing there and capturing an event. No, totally. I mean, it's and you can tell the people who've got an eye for it mm. and those who haven't. Yeah, just going back to um, the radio days. Uh, something that having read one or two um, 
radio presenters who have who'd started out on on radio, um, hospital radio and pirate radio, but certainly with the, the hospital side of it, they would talk about the the days when they would spend the day going around talking to the patients and going doing requests, and then that would be all day, and then going back and then putting it together and making the show. Is that the same kind of process that you had for? Um. To, to an extent, there were, there were limitations because of with it being a psychiatric hospital that there were uh, limitations to where we could go, what we could do and how we could do it. Um, but that said, they also wanted uh, the hospital radio to be part of the patient's life uh, with doing discos for... The patient, so we had a degree of leverage that we, you know, if we were going to do p- discos for the patients, we wanted to be able to have the patients involved with uh, the shows. We used to get mm. requests like anywhere else. Um, sometimes the requests weren't <laughs> massively polite. <laughs> it's like, can you can you stop playing this record or, or whatever? But it it, it was yeah, it, it was. Pretty much the same as uh, a normal radio station. With with that, we we do outside events. Uh, we did. Uh, I think one of the the big ones that we did was a, a big charity walk thing, that we were interviewing members of the public and what they thought about the hospital um, while we were going around. Which was it was very interesting to know uh, what the local villagers made of the old Victorian mental institution Mm -hmm. just down the road. Um, And it was all all very positive. You might think that it was was negative, but it it really wasn't. The the locals did did it sort of kind of embrace it. I mean, it was the tail end of a few local jokes, but but I I think that's the the sort of natural dark humour that we all have, isn't it? Yeah. As I said at the beginning, we are... In the Fenland area. Yeah. What does Fenland mean to you? Were you born in the Fenland areas or did you move to the Fenland areas or is this a choice or is it just a case of where you've landed? Goodness. Well, um, it's a good question. Um, I, I suppose part of it was accident that we, we came here. Uh, at the end of the DJing time, it was a question of what am I going to do? Uh, and the idea came up uh, with uh, buying a pub. Uh, so we looked all over the country for pubs that were doing what we wanted to do at the time that we were wanting to do it. And um, we'd sort of got in mind an oak beamed uh, uh, character mm. pub down in Cornwall or Devon or Somerset. And we spent a lot of time looking at pubs down in that neck of the woods. Uh, but they were, there was always a problem. They were either too expensive mm-hmm. because they were exactly what you wanted in exactly where you wanted them. And everybody and else wants yeah, them. Yeah, <laughs> so you just couldn't afford them. Yeah. Or it was a nice little pub that was what you exactly what you wanted but it was doing no trade at all mm. because it was in the middle of a no middle of nowhere up at half halfway up a mountain or yeah uh, and and nobody would go to it sounds uh, nice but yeah, practicality uh, is uh, yeah uh, at the end of the day you've you've if you're buying you're not just buying a house you're buying a business yeah so we were looking for places that were also places that weren't at the top of their game at the time, because you've, if you're buying a business that's at its peak, you've got one direction to go, and that's downhill. So we were looking for something that myself and my father could uh, put, inject uh, a little of our personality into, uh, build it up, mm-hmm. uh, and and develop it. And that's how we came to Chatteris. We found uh, the Honest John on South Park Street. And that was our home. We we bought it and uh, started doing it up, and we built some extensions and things onto it. 
and that that's that, that's how we came to to Chatteris. And um, having having come to Chatteris, wouldn't really want to be anywhere else. So where did you come from then? Uh, oh goodness, that's a that's a, a, a very conflict. I'll try and keep it short. Okay. Well, <laughs> I was, well I, I was born in Derbyshire. Okay. Uh, but my family moved south very shortly. I was only there for six months, so I didn't pick up the accent. Yeah, it's the uh, same, same here. <laughs> um, and my dad was in the uh, building industry, uh, and he was a contracts manager, and we bounced around. I lived, I lived all over the place. I lived in the West Indies mm. uh, for about four years, uh, lived in London for a little while, uh, lived in Cheam in Surrey, uh, eventually moved up to Hertfordshire and lived in Stevenage for 14 years. Hmm. So, and then moved from Stevenage up to uh, Chatteris. I was just going to say, how did you find um, staying in one place longer? That was something I, I always found with a childhood because I was moved yeah. every few years. And at the sort of every four years and then after, when I came to actually setting down roots and after four years I could feel myself going... I, I need to move. Sort of, yeah. How did you find that phase? Um, I, th I think it would be fair to say that I was a bit too busy to even sort of think about it. Well, that's good. I, I, I think you, uh, I think you always pine for where you've come from. I think there's because you know where things are, and for a, uh, I suppose for a couple of years, uh, having moved, a uh, sort of homesickness, if you mm. like. Uh, I think when you move to a new place you feel that there's nothing where you know it is. If, mm -hmm. that was a it's, it's, bad, it's, yeah, bad, well, it's bad learning, learning everything from yeah. scratch, isn't it? Uh, it is, and there, there is a, a lack of comfort mm. in not knowing where things are. But one of the big advantages of a pub is you've only got to say, I don't suppose you'd know where you can get, and you'll get 400 different answers. You, you're, never, you're never short of opinions... Uh, and uh, suggestions if you own a pub. Uh, and it was great for that if we said, well, we need a sheet of glass. And it was, oh, you want to go and see. <laughs> uh, and it, but with anything, you know, you, you'd ask. But the only thing is never ask directions in a pub. No. Because if the, you'll get 400 <laughs> different routes, uh, some of which will be very misleading. It must have been weird moving to somewhere new and then opening the doors and then everyone coming to you. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, it, it, was, it was kind of different. Uh, it was also different that they all, there was an expectation that we would know them already, although we were new. Uh, they would know your, your, reg, yeah, your, your the regulars. Yeah, the regulars. We are regulars, and this you, you are supposed to know what we drink. <laughs> uh, and and it, it, that took a little bit of getting used to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we did get we did get tuned into that very quickly, through necessity. So you talk about the pub, but obviously recently everything has changed. Your your your, your days in the pub have have come to an end. Yeah, sadly. How long? How many years have you? Uh, we were there thirty four years. So quite a substantial yeah. part of your life. Yeah. And so it must have been difficult, sort of just making that decision to sort of come to an end. It it was it was very difficult. Um, it was not a decision we made lightly. I, I think the uh, brewing industry has changed somewhat. I think that the what people want from pubs has changed mm. a little bit over the last few years. Um, the advent of people buying uh, so much out of their their alcohol from supermarkets it, it's it's made an impact. And I think the demand, certainly the demand for my pub went down. Yeah. Um, that might, I mean, I, I that might be uh, people thought, I uh, often considered that the uh, people have thought that they'd just had, in, had enough, maybe they're a bit bored because most publicans don't stay in one pub for that long. You move on to another pub uh, and you get a, new faces behind the bar. Maybe the, the 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 public were just a little bit tired of us. That's entirely possible. It's not. Re I I can't really judge it. Was, it was that, but the demand wasn't growing, shall we say? Um, 
And it, it's, it just seemed to be we, we had the pandemic. Mm-hmm. In case anybody hadn't noticed that we we had this we had this. <laughs> oh, is that what it was? <laughs> yeah, there's was, was this little pandemic thing went on for a while. Um, we had to suffer uh, being closed down yeah. a couple of times. I, I dare say, if it hadn't have been for the pandemic, we could well still be open, just sort of ticking along. It, it's probably one of the hardest things in the world to make a change. Um, most people are resistant to making changes and you'll sort of carry on with things because it's habit yeah. rather than anything else. But being closed for the best part of 18 months... Um, kind of forced your hand. Well... It, or it forced a decision. Yeah, it, it did. It, it forced a decision, but, but plus um, I do other things as well. Yeah, we, 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 we joke about the, the, the COVID having a an impact but it was a, a big like you say being closed for a significant point of a uh, part of your time it it had obviously had a big impact on choosing how to to, to go forward it it did I, it was still it's still a, a very difficult thing to do um we angsted uh, about should we close? Should we open? Should what should we do next? Um, uh, we 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 spent an awful lot of time. It was not an easy decision, um, and part of the uh, it not being an easy decision was you develop friendships mm. in the bar. I mean, yes, they're locals. Yes, they're regulars. Yes, they are part of your life. Mm. They, these are. People and and to an extent, you're saying goodbye to them. Yeah. Although I'm very very pleased to say that some uh, are kind enough to keep in contact, and they did throughout the pandemic. Uh, and I, hopefully, our friendship will continue beyond the pub. I'd like to think so, anyway. Yeah, that's good. I mean, Chatteris has a, a historical significance that it had one of the highest number of or the pubs. highest number of pubs. Yeah. In, in the town back, what, 150 years, 200 years? Yeah, um, I, it was, I, I've got a list of over 100. I know, it was, it was into three figures, certainly. Yeah. Were the, when you started then, were there, I mean, obviously there weren't still hundreds of pubs around, yeah. but there must have been more than there were now. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there was uh, the railway tavern on Clare Street. Uh, there was the cock that was... <laughs> There was a cop where the um, old Travis and Perkins place was mm-hmm. uh, on London Road. Um, some of the other pubs. There was the Spade and Beckett, where there was a kitchen gallery. Okay. Uh, I assume the kitchen gallery is still there. I think yes, it is. Right. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, that was Spade and Beckett. Um, goodness, I'm sure there was there was some. Uh, additional pubs other than that because you certainly see it as you walk around town you can see the, the elements y- that, that used you can to be as- associated yeah. with, with pubs outside and yeah like the old door scrapes and yeah and some of the the, the sort of uh, the sign um yeah the, the swinging sort swing, of brackets swing, yeah the, the brackets and stuff the, are still attached to the, yeah. the walls and it, but it, it's it's part of nature's way really uh, as, as a committed darwinist mm. you know Things fall by the wayside, and yeah. people's habits change. Um, you know the 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 advent of t- you know the ad not the advent of TV, but the advent the the growth of television uh, and cable and satellite and, and when there was, I think there was Sky uh, when we bought the pub, but it wasn't as prominent as as it is today. No, I know uh, Sky's been around for a long time. There's uh, a lot, lot of people, yeah, can can remember. I think it was early sort of mid nineties or something. Right. Yeah. Well, we we bought the the, the pub in eighty seven, so mm. it was. I, I think it was there, but it, it just wasn't as prominent. Pe- people's no. people's idea of a Saturday night was to go out and have a meal, mm. go out and have a couple of beers, uh, whereas a lot of people. They might go out for a pint, but it's a takeaway. Uh, go home to watch the match or, or whatever. Or oh, Anton Deck. Or oh, Anton Deck, yes. 
Yes, if, they, yeah, if they're changed, desperate enough. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, Ant and Deck. Um, <laughs> the weekends have changed. Sort of the the, the idea of yeah know, social social nature. Of I think it all changed. changes. Yeah. Yeah. And the the need for so many pubs is just, in my opinion, is, is not there anymore. Yeah. And the 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 pubs that are still in Chatteris, they do a great job. You know, I, there's, there's certainly no sour grapes on on my part. I I, I have every respect for for publicans, and they do do a great job. I suppose they're all trying to do the same thing. They're Absolutely. all trying to survive. They're yeah, all, totally. The ones that are doing well are the ones who sort of diversify and yeah. do other things, which is you know kind of what you've done as well. You've had a, like a second string to your bow, sort of thing. Absolutely. Um, but I mean, that second string uh, has uh, always always kind of been there with heading back towards the art really yeah um but just before we go down that route this is this is obviously not a, a plug but as a result of the, the 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 pub coming to an end you've you've decided that you want to sort of document and and write it or some right. uh, a, yes as as a book form i mean i know it's obviously still still in progress yeah. but what what made you choose to sort of Write it down. I well, I mean, ah, uh, 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 goodness. I suppose part of it is is a kind of personal therapy, um, in in terms of the cathartic nature of writing stuff down, um, as you might do in a diary, or uh, it, it's remembering what you've done and how how you've done it. Our, our, our path as a pub. I, I don't. It's it's so difficult to know how you were perceived. I have absolutely no idea, and to an extent, I'm not sure I want to. Um, but the 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 book is my perception of uh, from the I, the concept of shall we buy a pub, right the way through to uh, well, I suppose that's about it. Then I suppose mm. we, we need we need to close, uh, and looking at various aspects there will be i suppose in some people's minds this will be a, a, an opportunity for me to even scores or 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 but that that's that would be the absolute last thing in my mind um with pubs you make friends you make non-friends you can have a bit of a checkered career like I say, I'm not sure how I'm perceived within Chatteris. Um, and I'm sure if there's a comment box, <laughs> somebody will write something. Um, but it, it, that's, that's not the concept of the book at all. Um, it, it's re I'd like to think that readers of the book will perhaps have a little bit of a laugh at my expense, mm. uh, will perhaps... See the other what happens on the other side of the counter, uh, but it, it, there is certainly no malice, uh, and there is hopefully entertainment. I'd like I'd like to think people will find it a funny read. Uh, I look forward to to reading it when it when oh when you'll it's get done. you'll get your copy, <laughs> don't you? Don't you don't you worry, you'll get your copy. <laughs> I'll plug it in episodes in. in Months, yeah. episodes to come. Oh well, <laughs> undoubtedly there'll be a book, a book release. We'll have an events party. You come along, bring yeah, your camera. Forward. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the the art side. We, we started to talk about the the art side. It's obviously with the studio element. This this has obviously been documented in the the, the local papers as well. They've sort of cottoned onto the the story of the the pub closing and the expanding of of the the art studio but it's not expanding not structurally not, not, wise not is it it's, 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 we, we're going to have a bit of a, a, a shake up in the studio uh any of my artists uh, uh, are listening to this uh I, I only have one thing to say that i will be tidying up which will, <laughs> which it's reasonably which, tidy we've well, been there yeah, I, it could be a lot tidy. We're, we're we're planning on having a little bit of a shake up mm. in the studio just to just to sort out some more storage area so we can put things away so we're not tripping over uh, quite so much in there. Um, 
Because you do a lot of classes as well. You do teaching. Yeah, I, I do teach from the studio. I also go into schools teaching. Um, I, I do enjoy, I've got to say, I do enjoy teaching from uh, quite young kids all the way up to... Uh, mm, You've done children. prison. Prison. Ooh. Um, I haven't taught in prisons. Did you, I, I did, did you I, not I, did, No, I've, I've visited... The, 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 these actually... Uh, uh, an art student that I did work very briefly with who's the uh, art teacher or was the art teacher at uh, Whitemore Prison. We we went there for, uh, we were invited to go to an exhibition of uh, prisoners' work uh, and that was massively enlightening. Mm. That, that was a, a, a very different thing to do. It was one of the great things about being an artist. You do get invited to unusual things yes and i i love that about it you never really know quite what you i keep i keep sort of throwing bits and pieces out there i'd quite like twos yeah uh, in, in the hope that i get invited to go and do other things um but it was it was yeah, it was a very interesting thing to go around whitemore i do exactly the same i keep saying that i would like to work with ridley scott but you know he's not got in touch oh, and and <laughs> and he's he's the worst for it oh. <laughs> Give the man a ring, Ridley. Yes. Uh, it's, and, and if anybody can get me into a jet fighter, <laughs> I, I would be. If anybody could actually physically get me into a jet fighter, I'd be. Yeah, uh, I'd be very keen to to have a go. Well, I was in the I'll military just for for twenty two years, and I never got to get sit in one. That's, that's I got o- overlooked. Yeah. It, was, it was always someone else that got to go. That, that's such a shame. So if you got would you if if somebody gave you the opportunity to go for a jolly in a in a jet do right yeah <laughs> so would I I'd be in there strap myself in before they even finish the sentence <laughs> yeah no, oh, I, I've I've had uh, quite a bit of flying history so mm-hmm. yeah I like I like flying yeah um, me too. I mean I managed to tick off a few few aircraft to to have a, a ride in uh, just unfortunately fast jet was was never one of them yeah. That's part of my life, I'm sure. Maybe an opportunity, but you can you can buy um, experienced flights. Yeah, and you can so you can go and get put in the back of of something and exotic and get taken up. I, I I've got to say I am slightly tempted to go into uh, one of these two seater Spitfires. Mm. I and mean, Caroline Grace has got one down yeah. at Duxford. And I have severe that. That is a plug, Caroline. If you do want to give me a ride, <laughs> I will give you another name check. If, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I something like that. That that was. I I went up to um, oh, where's the Battle of Britain Memorial flight? Oh, Coningsby. Coningsby. Um, uh, my next door neighbour, uh, his brother worked at Coningsby. And he invited me up there, and I got to climb about in the uh, city of Lincoln, mm. uh, the Lancaster. Yeah, I got to sit in the pilot seat, and I physically wouldn't fit in the rear gunner's turret. No, that's a bit that of a, is, a that's tight a, crawl, that, that, even for the for the, yeah. <laughs> the smaller of us. Yes, I, I I wouldn't fit physically fit in there, but I, I did climb around in it. I did suggest at the time that I would quite like to sit in a Spitfire. Uh, but I was tactfully told that there were serving, uh, serving uh, military that would also like to. They're not going to, so neither was I. Yeah. So, which is fair. But yeah. I thought I'd fly it out there. You know, you never know. Yeah, there's there's always opportunities. One thing that I am looking to develop are more art classes at the studio. Um, we're looking to set up our life drawing class again. Um, that finished a, a couple of years ago. Um, and it's something that I want to get out again and I want to uh, also have one or two more adult classes um, which will be sort of basically for for beginners and improvers and uh, for skill development Uh, Yeah, because you talked about um, when we did the last podcast you were talking about online learning and obviously doing a lot more classes on Online, so it must be nice to actually get the studio back people, up and running yeah. and getting people back in. There, there is a uh, the, the the advent of Zoom was quite interesting and doing Zoom teaching, um, that, and that was very different. Um, 
But there's nothing really quite like working with people face to face. Yeah. Um, it's why it's so nice to be doing this here in a studio rather than you, you're sat at home with a with a uh, with a headset. Yeah, on. Yeah, and it, 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 it you feel so detached, and it's like that with when you're teaching. Yeah. You you it, when you're teaching, you can see the expressions on people's faces a lot better. Mm-hmm. You can see if they're nodding off or if they're bored or they're patronising you or they're, they're really not interested in. And you can adjust your teaching to compensate for, you know, you can either make it a little more exciting, you can find things that you don't know whether you're covering ground that they already know, so they're a little bit bored about what you're saying. Um, and also the, the kind of the whole feedback thing, if you're with people, you just miss out on with yeah with yeah I mean teaching. I, I know what you mean it's it's most of the th- this was um, this this um, podcast was all set up during COVID mm. so we we planned for our very first um, recording was to be two people in the same place um, and everything took a, a turn and basically every um, every episode that we've done has been predominantly done over the internet mm. or been remotely done between two two locations and then stitched together um which has meant a lot of work for me but it it does have that um a very different kind of feel to it yeah and so actually having you in the studio you know it, it's a, it's a nice change and actually it's nice to have somebody with you and like you say it's the visual cues the the sort of the subtleties Absolutely. of actually having someone right right in front of you talking, and it's you can tell when to move on. Uh, you know, as an interviewer, you can see whether it's time to change the subject or or whatever. Uh, and it, it's it, it's got to, it's got to be very difficult to to pick up those cues when you were doing the interviews uh, online. So I can start doing all hand signals and. Yeah. and tell you. <laughs> Wind up, cut, and <laughs> but I've, I've got to, I've got to say, I mean, I listen to the uh, to your show on, on a very regular basis. Although I didn't comment, or I don't know, because I think that's the nature of that sort of broadcasting that there are way more people out there listening hmm. than you think that there are. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I used to, I used to find it very, very entertaining. I'm actually to, talking to more and more people who have listened. Mm. And it's it's not the demographic that I expected it to be, you know. I, I kind of whether it be naive or I just I just didn't expect it to to go beyond a certain mm. you know age bracket or a, a regional bracket. So you know, I'm I'm talking to people, youngsters. Mm. You know, I didn't think that this would be sort of the sort of thing that, that younger younger listeners would would take on, but I've had people, you know, that said, "Oh yeah, we've we've enjoyed, we've we've listened to elements of your of your series," and I thought, "Okay, that's 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 a real surprise." That's well, I, I mean, I mean I, it's I, lovely. I, it's, I, it's it's. I think it spoke. I think it spoke to most people, though. I really do. I I I, I think it. I I never thought of it as being sort of. Age specific. Mm. Uh, I just found it very entertaining. I think being having done some writing and doing script work and and creating videos, you have to have a, an audience. You know, you keep getting told. You know, if you're going to do something, you got to know who your audience is and who you're pitching this at. Mm. So you kind of have a a preconceived idea of who your main audience is. Mm. So when you have people outside those expectations as come back to you, mm. I think you know that it, it's wonderful. You know you, you've kind of hit where you want, and it's it's then grown and gone elsewhere. Yeah. Well, they they sometimes they 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 seem to take on a life of their own when you've got once a show's out there on. You know, people will just come across it. It's mm. not like they're taken down or yeah, they're still accessible. Exactly. So, one, you you have many strings. You know, we talk about second strings, but you actually have many strings. And beside the the, the pub and then the studio, 
as well. But you also do publishing. You got into to publishing. Um, how how long ago was that? I mean, uh, I, I started. Uh, I'd, I'd always wanted to get into publishing, even from my school days. Wanted to, mm. but um, it was a, it was a very different thing back then. There, there's another in, publishing is another industry that's changed mm. uh, dramatically. Yeah, uh, in the last thirty years, um, when I was first looking to get published, uh, the chances of an unknown author getting published was the same. Uh, odds as winning the lottery or being struck by lightning, yeah, roughly f- fourteen million to one, um, and it, it it really wasn't an easy path if you wanted to head in that direction. Uh, but uh, I, it was one of those things that was on my to do list, uh, and I just sort of kind of generally plugged away at it. Um, I f- my first. Um, uh, my first delving into publishing was as an illustrator uh, doing book covers. Uh, and I started doing that uh, back in the early 2000s. Uh, and uh, I was picked up by a couple of publishers, um, and did their covers for them. And then I came across uh, a romance publishing house called Black Velvet Seductions. And I started doing their covers for them. Um, They started a project uh, uh, of an anthology, uh, which they invited me as the cover artist to go along to the meeting, uh, uh, which I did. Uh, And I thought, well, do you know, I'd love to offer a story Mm. to for this anthology. Uh, And I chatted to the publisher, and they said that. Uh, they'd give it a go if I wanted to write something. Uh, I wrote my first piece uh, and uh, it was accepted. So I became a published author at the same time, Excellent. which was which was rather <laughs> rather nice. Not bad for a, a poor old dyslexic boy. So you you can you can have dyslexia and uh, still be an author. It's not it's not uh, not something that prevents you from doing it. Though I, you do need a little bit of help, I have to say. Yes, that's that's something that's you know very much. I'm an advocate of you yeah. know trying to let people know. I mean, I've I've got a little bit of dyslexia. I've got dyspraxia, mm. you know, and it's it's something that does have a, a big hold over your life for for a long time. And certainly for me, it's it's been a a, a big holding or sort of yeah. It it can restrict. It was one of the factors that stopped me being a radio disc jockey. Mm. Because if somebody hands me a piece of paper that I have to read out aloud, um, th- uh, it thank- throws you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 if I was to learn it verbatim, I can, I can announce it. So yeah. There's n- not too much of a problem. But they, they hand you a, a a piece of paper. They expect you to read it out aloud, mm. uh, and that wasn't really in my skill set, especially yeah. if it was a long, complicated piece that needed to be done accurately. Yeah. Um, so I mean that that's always been a a, a bit of a thing. Certainly for, as a writer, that's a bit of a thing. As I'm sure Jane, our BVS's proofreader, uh, has found her her cost when she has to proofread anything of mine. Um, yeah, I'm sure I drive her a little bit crazy. I certainly drive uh, Marion Savile, my my assistant, absolutely uh, crazy with some of the things that I write down. Though she's got a wicked sense of humour, it's, it's <laughs> worth it's worth giving. Marion a quick name check too. Um, she, out of humour, used to let some of my spelling mistakes go because they were funny. <laughs> <laughs> For example, um, uh, she would let this one go out in emails to authors, knowing that it wasn't serious, but it, it, it would make me look a little bit stupid, uh, which I think is fair. Um, she'd let things like, uh, I would say... I would be definitely doing something. But I hadn't written definitely. I'd written defiantly. <laughs> so I would be defiantly doing something today. <laughs> Which, uh, But I, I think you've got to take it, if you're dyslexic, you've got to take it on the chin uh, every now and again. And uh, 
I certainly, I, you see the funny side of these things all the time. But a lot of famous people are, aren't they? They are, yes. I mean, I, I didn't know what I had. I just knew there was something, and but it was holding sort of, you back. Or yeah, I think in the way. once once I knew what it was, then I kind of like, okay, well, how do we go around this? Yes. How how do we, how do we use this? You know, yeah. Instead of having um, feeling uh, diffi- different from everyone else, yeah. Um, you know, why am I a bit different? And then understanding, and then going, well, okay, well, what can we do about it? Yeah. And then how do we utilize this? You know, how do we turn this into an advantage instead yeah. of you know a hindrance? I, th- I think a lot of creative people have got something in 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 that line. Uh, a, a lot of creative people seem to, uh, and I think it allows us to see things in a slightly different way. We make different connections. Yeah, yeah. And I I, I think it uh, for me, I, if if there was a, a tablet to say that you can take this tablet and you're no longer dyslectic, I'm not sure I'd want to take it. No, it, it's given me my rather odd outlook on things i think we certainly do see the world in a different way mm. and i think that's what makes things colorful for for people if everyone was I say normal but just yeah. didn't have any differences yeah you know, if everyone was exactly the same then we would be producing the same material yeah all the time having people who are different who have um different perceptions of the world mm. with a dis- Braxia, dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysphasia, yeah. all, all the autism, yeah. Asperger's. We all come at the world from a different perspective. And seeing that brings colour and variety when producing artwork, films, documentaries, talking. And it sort of makes you think. It makes you think about the world in a different way. You know, totally how, agree, yeah. So, yeah I'm, I'm all for it, you know, to, to try and encourage, you know, younger people who who are going through the sort of identify, identifying who they are you know coming to terms with um these these disabilities well they are to start with but learning what they are and how to use them mm. they can be your strengths as well absolutely you know, you know going from from me i've gone into to writing i've, I've never i say i did stop because I found it was really hard work, and oh. it was it was a hindrance, but now it's not, and I find ways to work around it so that I do get the help in the right places. Mm. And I've written screenplays, I've had them produced and uh, made into films. Um, I've done my own films. I'm doing my own audio audio drama at the moment, which I've written. You know, I've I've gone from I had the idea, I've written the scripts. I'm now in the process of recording. It shouldn't let you stop. It's just a case of utilising these these skills and, and finding people to help you on that journey. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, I am a little reliant on some people for some tasks. Mm. Um, but being reliant on people for... I mean, we're reliant on all sorts of people Yeah. Uh, during the course of our life. Uh, I don't see that as really any, any different. And uh, no, I, 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 th- I think it's it's really important to put out a you know a, as a positive thing that you know it's, it might have held us back at times, but I think it's given it, it it's given us something as well. Yeah, it makes you stand out as well. It makes you something gives you a different or a more unique pers- um, perspective mm. um, and um, presence in the world. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think it does. Well, just a, just a, a little little bit more on on the publishing side, yeah. uh, which is is kind of my area where I'm that I'm developing at the moment. Um, uh, I took the step uh, from being the cover artist to um, taking over as publisher mm. uh, back in two thousand thirteen. Yeah. Uh, uh, as I wanted to produce my own book, uh, I started my own side to the company, uh, wanting to produce a book on f- the First World War. Mm-hmm. Myself and Marion Savile produced uh, a book on World War One uh, from an artist's perspective. Yeah, uh, and it was at that time that the person that owned Black Velvet Seductions 
lovely lady called Laurie Sanders. Um, she asked me how serious I was uh, going into publishing and would I like to buy her publishing house, uh, which I did, um, for better, for worse. Uh, and uh, uh, I've, I've been the uh, publisher of romantic fiction, bodice rippers and all. <laughs> well, it must have been odd... Sort of going back, telling, talking to yourself as a an eighteen, twenty year old, and saying, "Right, this is this is where your life is going to go." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, life is a funny thing, isn't it? Mm. You never really know the twists and turns, do you? No, you don't. I mean, I, I is yeah. I mean, I I wanted to sort of head towards making films and uh, and writing as a as a teenager. Um, and my life diverted very strongly in a completely opposite direction. Yeah. Um, so to come back and actually be in, end up being where I started, uh, and doing what 30, you want to do thirty years later, yeah. it's um, it's quite a, it's a it's a nice experience. Yeah. I, I I mean I feel exactly the same way about it. I mean I the 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 thread that's run through it all uh, has been art. Hmm. Uh, for me, uh, but it, it's just—it's just an interesting journey, isn't it? Hmm. So, are you going to keep keep going with the the publishing for for a while now? Yeah, I mean, I, we're still looking to develop aspects of it. Uh, the romance publishing side is ticking along. We have produced over a hundred books. Um, we've got a string of uh, about 20, 25 uh, authors that are producing works as fast, if not just a little bit faster than we can publish them. Mm. Um, we are also looking at art books. It's That's been a passion of mine. We've got some more art books uh, due to come out uh, fairly shortly. Uh, I've got a children's book that's um, coming out. I'm sure the author would like it out before Christmas. <laughs> Whether we can actually get it out before Christmas is 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 is, is an interesting thing. Mm. I shall do my very best. Um, uh, but that's an interesting book in itself. That's we've never done anything that apart from the potty training book, which I suppose is vaguely educational. Um, but this is really quite properly educational, mm. looking at homonyms um, and uh, helping kids with words that sound the same but aren't spelt the same. Oh, like there, there and there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, you, perfect example <laughs> and one that you will find between the pages of this book. Um, and it, it, it's I, I've not really worked on an educational project quite like this before. Um it, it's it, it's been slightly unusual in terms of the fact that I have very little uh, uh, writing or art control over this. Um, it's uh, a lady from Wisbeach who's writing the book in collaboration with two of her daughters. Mm. And between the three of them, they are producing the artwork uh, and the text... Um, and I'm just... Steering it. Yeah, sort of steering it uh, and adding my uh, graphic design qualifications to the to the mix and actually making their ideas come together on the page, yeah. which is... So it's more like a project management role. Yeah, it, it's unusual for me, and it, it, it's, it, it's kind of like a breath of fresh air. So mm. it's, it, it's nice to... I never like to limit what I do and how I do it. I, I like to try and take on new things uh, for their own merit. Yeah, definitely. So what's next for, for Rick then? Oh, goodness. Uh, possibly a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> we all need one of them, don't we? Yeah. I, well, I, I mean, I, I've, I've been a bit of a workaholic uh, most of my life. I, mm. I've never really taken anything more. If, if I've taken uh, uh, 10 days off in a row, that is a major holiday. For yeah. me, I, I I really just don't take uh, much off in the way of time. It tend, 
my little world happens to be pretty much seven days a week. Even if some of the days are fairly light, um, you're still working seven days a week. While I had the pub open, I was still ru running the, the publishing and the art, uh, which was giving me 100-hour weeks. Mm. Uh, and I've cut my hours down now to about 40 hours. Back to a normal, 40, 40. A normal working Yeah, week. normal work. I, but I feel like I'm a bit of a part-timer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you Only do. doing 40 hours a week. It, yeah. it seems a little unnatural. But I think so, that's the thing with artists in general, is that yeah. you, because it's a passion and it's... Yeah. it's it, well, it's more than a job. It's it's you. Yeah, And so is. that it sort of encroaches all hours and all elements of the... Yeah. You, well, you, you can't. It's one of those things that you can't turn off. No. I mean, I quite often wake up at four in the morning, and it's either you lay there thinking about what you're going to do, or you actually get up and do, do it. it. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm a. <laughs> well, you forget about it. What? Yeah. I, well, I'm more of a get up and get mm. on with it. So I, I mean, I, I'm actually working on a painting for you at the moment. You are. That's yes. the, the a poster for a film project that yeah. you're working on. Uh, and I was up the other morning, it must have been about four o'clock, and I thought, do you know what? I'm going to do a bit of this. <laughs> uh, and that's it makes for an unusual lifestyle, mm. uh, as my wife undoubtedly would tell anybody uh, that I am an, an odd chap where it comes to that sort of thing. But if, you, if you're wide awake at four in the morning and you feel like doing a bit of painting, I'm not really seeing there's a major problem with that. No. I mean, I have, I have a notebook. Mm. And pen by the the bed because you wake up in the in the middle of the night if you've got a good idea you don't you've got to get it, it up because you know by by eight o'clock in the morning it yeah. will have gone yeah no that that's absolutely right I think that's a nice place to to bring the uh, the chat hour to an end I think we've we've um, we, we'll we'll have enough to to make an hour <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I told you I'd never shut up <laughs> so it's been wonderful to talk to you Rick. Oh, it's been it's been thank you so much for inviting me uh, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you david well we we have talked about um just doing a a chat together um just on on you and your life uh, oh, we've God. talked about it for a, uh, for a <laughs> couple of years so it it's nice to know it's actually it's actually happened yeah. i think part of it is because you no longer have the pub you've actually got the time to come and sit down for yeah. a <laughs> It's true. I'd be I'd be thinking about opening time. Yeah, you always had to rush off and yeah. do something else. So it's actually, I suppose, just uh, a combination of of factors and and having the time to actually do it just yeah. meant that we actually had the time to actually sit down and 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 do this. Yeah, and it's, it's and it's really a joy to do. Well, it's been lovely talking to you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and you're more than welcome to come back and do another one. Oh, I'm sure there's more more Care, elements. There. Careful what you say. <laughs> well, you know, you could end up being a regular. Well, always, and, always and you, a perspective to... of uh, um, of what you're doing. Maybe talk more about the books you do, or, or always happy to chat. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Rick, and thank you to you for for listening, uh, putting up for us for another another hour. Uh, we will be back with another um, another guest soon. And uh, more information will be online about that. So thank you very much and goodbye.